Last year at a conference I attended a talk from one of the core team members of Webpack. And at one point in his talk he asked who here uses Webpack? And everybody raised their hands. And then he asked but who here actually understands Webpack? And then almost nobody raised their hands. So it's quite telling for a tool that everybody uses because it's great but you, they don't really know how it works. So it seems like to many people, Webpack is kind of a unicorn that uses magic and rainbows to do its job. And then to others that use those super fancy CLI tools to scaffold their projects, they might not even know what it does or if it exists at all. Because those fancy CLI tools are kind of zero config. They are amazing, don't get me wrong. I use them myself. But if you understand Webpack, you can use it to your advantage and you can actually architect your application better and get much better performance out of it. Um, so this video will go over the basics um, of Webpack, go over its core concepts so you can start rolling your own. Are you ready? Let's roll that intro. All right, how Webpack works. As you can see, I'm taking a slightly different approach to the video today. I'm using some slides so I can show you um, information in an easier way. Okay, let's get to it. How does Webpack work? To a lot of people, it's this. Pure magic. But actually, if you look into it, it's not that magical. It does amazing things, but it's quite simple. Actually, Webpack is a static module bundler for modern JavaScript apps. What this means is you take a bunch of modules, you put them in Webpack, it does its magic, we'll discuss what that is, and then it outputs bundles. And those bundles are less files than what you put in. And those bundles are optimized. That's all it does. Of course it does more, but we'll go over the extras of what it does on top of that later on. But before we dive in, we need to actually check what did we have before, when we still had Steve Ballmer yelling developers with sweat. Look at him. He's, look at this guy. Wow. Anyways, so what we used to have is this. So we had static assets and then, so this is in development. And then we went to production and we had the same. These were simple websites we used to build. I am old enough to remember that we used tables and spacer cells and images to build our stuff. We didn't have that many static assets back in the day. But then as time went on, we needed more because we are doing more component-based design. So we had JavaScript, CSS, and images, for example, for one component and a bit of backend code. And then you, we started to get a whole bunch of smaller JS files. And that actually was too slow because all those HTTP calls and later on HTTPS calls we're just too slow for the browser, so we had to concatenate those files, and that's when we got this. We had some PHP magic, and I was lucky enough to work with great backend developers that had this affinity for frontend. So they're like, yes, let's try to optimize this. So what we did together is like, I said, this is what I want. How do we get there? And it needs to be super simple. So they built a script, and there were many of those out there. Um, but basically what we did is they took a bunch of files, and you could give the file paths in the query parameter to the PHP script and it would just grab the file from the server and put them all together in um, one file that became one JS file. Um, and over time we started to do that with CSS, but we might we sometimes even optimized the JPEGs because we had this PHP language, right? And then this came out, YUI compressor. Um, a lot of youngsters will not know what this is, but you're not missing much. But this was back in the day what we used because it was able to compress JavaScript and CSS. So as far as I remember, it was able to remove all the spaces and really compress your scripts or styles. And it would, and I think it might even also change your uh, variable names to smaller um, names, like from, from 10 letters to one, because we didn't have to read it anymore. It was just compiled. So this was like, among a couple of others, was the first effort to actually try to optimize stuff. So then after this, a lot of other tools came. I won't go into them now, but we had stuff like Grunt and Gulp and Browser Refine. There were all kind of 
around this stuff and they were not all doing the same thing but it, it in the end combining those tools would get you this concatenated assets right so now we have this look at the magic of a web pack here the biggest difference is we actually have this part here now so basically we also had this with browserify but webpack just does it a bit better so basically it looks at it creates a dependency graph of this group of files so we have an entry file that says okay i need this view file in this case it's view can be anything um, and i need that javascript file and then that javascript file depends on this one and this one and so basically webpack is able to create this graph of which file depends on what and based on that you can do smart stuff and that smart stuff you can com you can configure yourself so basically um based on that graph it knows what to output and create highly optimized static assets um and what it does here you can actually configure if you want so let's have a look at first the basics and then the core concepts of what it actually does what that this nice block of magic what that actually is so first of all anytime one file depends on another webpack treats this as a dependency so this can be non-code assets like images or fonts or svg files or css files or whatever um, so webpack looks at an entry point builds a dependency graph and takes only the modules your app needs and combines them into bundles so what I mean by only the modules your app needs is if you load a big NPM library, but you only use two functions out of the 25, Webpack actually realizes, hey, you only use those two. So let me just take those two from that library and put those in the bundle. There's no need to do the rest also. And this is where Webpack truly shines. So let's talk about the core concepts with the alien guy. Yes, he's awesome. Look at that hair. So core concepts, the entry file. So this is the file from which Webpack starts creating the dependency graph. And it's actually very simple. You just say entry, this is my file. So this is the index file of your application. And here you can say, here I'm declaring all my JavaScripts, um, let's say my few files or my React component, stuff like that. But you can also load, let's say your CSS here, right? So this file, contains everything you need. And then this graph, the dependency graph is built from this. Okay, output. So this tells Webpack where to store the generated bundles. Relatively simple, right? And in Webpack 4 and 5, the ones that are out now, you don't even need to do this. You can do it completely without config because it has very sensible defaults. As long as you use um, the index.js in the source folder and you use the dist as the output. Um, but you can also configure this and there's a lot more to it but we're not going to go into that in this uh, video so let's get to the fanciness loaders right so webpack understands only javascript and json out of the box so you need if you do any sort of other modules other type of files um, basically they allow the processing of other files like into usable modules for your app so loaders have two conf configuration properties. So one, which type of file am I transforming? And then two, which loader do I use to transform them? So in this case, you can see each TXT file will be loaded using the raw loader. And those loaders can do um, a whole bunch of things. And if you have SVG files, you might use an SVG loader. If you have Vue.js files or React components, you might want to use the Vue.js loader or the React loader or the Babel loader. So these loaders can do things to those components or to those files that make them into usable modules for the bundling later on. Okay, plugins. So plugins extend Webpack's core capabilities, right? So in this case, this is, um, super handy in this case we have let's say the html webpack plugin this plugin uh, actually creates um, an index.html file let's see what i write here so the html webpack plugin creates an html file injects the bundle file names oh that was short so it basically those bundle file names can be dynamic so this plugin knows those 
file names or understands by hooking into the core capabilities of Webpack and injects them. There are also many other types of plugins, right? So um, they can be used for many different things like bundle optimization, like um, compressing it or doing post CSS stuff um, or to um, asset management. You can do bundling of files so you can optimize the files. They can inject variables into your code base. It's a whole bunch of cool stuff that comes on top. It helps you a lot um, with Webpack. So you can see it's super flexible, right? You can do many things. Okay, so mode. So the mode can be development, production, or none. And in real life, you tend to have just development and production. So when its mode is set to production, it will highly optimize all the files. Um, so it will do um, compression and a whole bunch of stuff. And in development, you have more debug tools. So that's a good one to know. Um, let's talk about the extras, because up until now, Webpack does the same thing as what we had before, just way smarter and way more flexible. And it's mainly configuration based. You don't have to code that much like with Gulp, for example. But there's a bunch of extras that they built into the ecosystem that are just awesome. So. Let's get to it. Cool extra, extras, the Webpack Dev Server. The Webpack Dev Server is a super cool plugin that actually um, creates a server for you, um, a node server that can serve your application. And that works really well together with hot module reloading, which means um, it serves um, your file or for your app. And then when you change a file, let's say you change one component or one module, it automatically reloads only that module in your bundle live in the server so you can or in your browser so you can just code and you can do this with css or any type of bundle and then when webpack is watching that's a property you can turn on we'll see that later when it's on it will hot module reload that module directly into the browser so you just see it work so you only need this you don't need more you don't need browser sync stuff like that of course that's cool to have but you don't have to um, that is a really neat feature. And then we have tree shaking. We discussed this a little bit. I won't go into deep too much, but it's able to um, figure out the stuff you need rather than including everything. It only includes the stuff you need so you can highly optimize your bundle. And if you understand this well, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to make this even more optimized. Then chunked bundles. Again, very interesting. Because especially with React applications nowadays, they become really big. Um, they actually become four or five megabytes for one bundle. And that is just crazy. Um, and nowadays we actually have HTTP2. So you can do more parallel downloads just as fast as before with single downloads. Again, a big subject I won't go into deep now. But you can actually do some smartness by um, chunking your bundle into multiple chunks and still maintain how the dependencies work together, but you can load files separately. And that's um, and they have a lot of smartness inside Webpack to do that. So it's a bit too detailed to go into now. If you're interested, I can do another video on all those things separately to actually dive deep, but this is a super cool feature that we really need. Um, and then it understands all types of JavaScript modules from AMD to CommonJS or ECMAScript model imports, all of that stuff, it just understands them. So this makes it super uh, flexible. And then you can use aliases. So um, sometimes you have um, a folder structure that's super deep that you have to use every time on every import. You can actually make an alias in your configuration for that path. So you don't have to type that whole path all the time in all your files. So that's super handy as well. And then there's the watcher. Um, the watcher is actually, um, so you turn set to watch is true. And then Webpack just looks at every file that's changing and then does an action based upon that. Um, and that's it for this video. So I didn't go into too much depth, but actually I hoped I managed to actually give you an overview of all of the different um, features Webpack has and also all its core concepts. And I've been able to do this in 13 minutes now. It's not that much, like a conference talk is longer, right? So um, I hope this was clear and please try to um, do this yourself. Just go into the documentation. It's a great documentation. 
and just roll your own. Well, there you have it. As you can see, it's not that complex if you understand the core concepts. What goes on in the loaders and in the plugins, of course, it's more complex and it's amazing. But the core concepts are really understandable. So now it's up to you to just try and roll your own config and just read the documentation, grab some stuff from that others have made and use their cool stuff to actually figure out how you can do this yourself. I guarantee you will learn a lot about how to optimize stuff for the web. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.